Hey everyone, and welcome to the Braver Angels podcast. I'm your host, Monica Guzman. Now today, I am really excited to be introducing my conversation with one of the most fascinating thinkers on all things polarization, division, morality, and these days even social media and communication. And that is the professor and author and thinker, Jonathan Haidt. Now in the last several months, I've been traveling the country talking to people about how to bridge divides in their own lives, how they can try it, how it works, why they ought to really consider it, even where it feels really, really hard. And one of the most challenging uh, questions that I get and challenges that I get and hear all the time to this work is around the idea that to be a good person, one must not engage across the political divide around certain topics or with certain people, that there must be some kind of red line, that that's what it takes to be to be good and that that is a limit to this work. Knowing everything that Jonathan has been working on, I was so curious to get his take on this and to dive into the broader universe of ideas that he's been developing. Things like how social media has contributed to what he calls structural stupidity in our communication. Also, what does it do even to young people or to all people to be spending so much time in the world of politics, sort of anxiety-inducing types of topics? How do we encounter disagreement? And what kinds of assumptions do we have about what we'll find uh, if we try to cross that divide? How do we think about harm? Harm in different ideas. Harm when we talk about things that might be even untrue. So all this and more <laughs> comes up in this conversation, which is why I'm so excited to share it with you all today. And when I did ask him pretty directly, like, hey, there's this idea, right? That if I'm a good person, I cannot engage across the divide. When is that idea right? And when is that idea wrong? You might be surprised at his answer. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Jonathan Haidt. Hope you enjoy. Hello, John. I'm so glad that you could join us uh, today for the Braver Angels podcast. How are you? Very well. Very nice to see you, Moni. I'm very excited to be talking with you. Awesome. Well, let's dig right in. I happen to have uh, some props for, for this opening question. Ten years ago, you wrote The Righteous Mind. Uh, why people are why good people are divided by politics and religion. A few years later, the coddling of the American mind, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. And that was with Greg Lukianoff. And then this year, this groundbreaking essay in The Atlantic, after Babel, how social media dissolved the mortar of society and made America stupid. Mm -hmm. So uh, give us the bird's eye view of this uh, eventful decade in yeah. moral and social psychology and where it's led you. Well, I think we should start with my first book, which was called The Happiness Hypothesis, Finding Modern Truth and Ancient Wisdom. And that's my wife's favorite book because it's the only one that is uh, happy and positive and upbeat. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, so I always like to do, I think it's good when you tell like multiple stories that kind of parallel each other intersect. And so one is, is the incredible story of the last, uh, you know, 40 or 50 years, um, which is just that, yeah, I know I was born in 1963 during, you know, when it was illegal to, it was legal to discriminate against people based on their race. And I was born uh, just after the Cuban Missile Crisis and just before the assassination of John Kennedy. And, and the 20th century was this incredible century that ends on this glorious note with the fall of the Berlin Wall and technology coming in that's going to make a democracy forever and ever. And, you know, the 90s was this incredible, incredible decade. 
when it seemed as though things that couldn't ever get resolved were getting resolved, and peace was breaking out in Israel and Ireland, and it was an amazing time. Um, and uh, and then gradually everything changes in the 20th, 21st century. Um, and so um, I began to be concerned about political polarization in 2007. Um, I, I had begun studying left-right differences in 2004 because I wanted to help the Democrats stop losing so badly. Like most social scientists, I was on the left and, and I thought it was appropriate to use my position as a university professor, not to influence my students, but to use my research to help one party. I no longer think that's appropriate, but I did back then. Uh, and that's how I actually began writing The Righteous Mind. It was gonna be, uh, it was gonna be basically like, here's moral psychology that'll help the left understand what the hell it doesn't understand about the broader morality of most people. But by the time I got into it, I started reading conservative writings. Um, I read the best conservatives writing, writings, not the worst. If you read the best from both sides, you see, wow, you actually can't understand things unless you look at it from multiple perspectives. So, um, so that work was real. It, 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 it became not how does the left understand what it doesn't understand, but my God, we all need to understand each other. We all need to be listening and learning. Um, and if we're gonna, if we're gonna have this, you know, I didn't feel the country was coming apart back then exactly, but it was like if we're gonna live together peacefully, we've got to understand, uh, understand each other. Uh, and that, that I guess I finished the manuscript in 2011, handed it in. It came out in 2012. Um, and since then, the 2010s. I now believe have been the most disastrous decades since the 1930s. Mm. And we're going to, historians will look back on this 100 years from now as, as the beginning or the end of an old era, um, the, the era that the 20th century era with mass media and liberal democracy triumphant. I think it's going to be the beginning of a much darker era. And we have no idea how long it's going to go on for, um, but it's a very dark and dangerous era. And maybe that's a good setup for just how serious these things are that, that, that you're writing about as well, that many of us are writing about, about why it seems as though we're just coming apart as a country. Mm -hmm. So what are the biggest concerns you're trying to address, zooming into that decade mm -hmm. and what's gone wrong? Um, so my basic perspective is that um, we, we human beings, were, we evolved for small group living, which was full of violence extraordinary intergroup violence. Um, and we, we developed this tribalism, this tribal psychology, um, that, and our ancestors are the ones who are successful at that. They were the ones who were successful at holding territory, killing their enemies, maintaining some degree of cohesion. Um, and, and, and beginning um, in the last couple hundred years, we developed these liberal democracies that allow us to live way above our design constraints. We can live peacefully among each other. Uh, you know, young women can walk the streets without worrying about being abducted and raped. I mean, whatever else you want to say about the crime rate, it's essentially zero compared to what it would have been uh, the safety of, of people uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago. So we were living way above our design constraints with, with institutions and norms and values that were built up gradually over centuries for liberal democracy. And then everything changed in the 2010s, I argue, um, because social media connected, reconnected us in, in ways. Mark Zuckerberg said something in his 2012 uh, letter to shareholders when he was taking Facebook public, something like Facebook aspires to rewire society and give people the tools to, you know, to restructure all of their institutions. Now, if you've read any of Edmund Burke or any conservative writing, you would think this is kind of insane. Um, you know, institutions are very easy to destroy and very hard to build. And the idea that we could just change everything, change all the, all the social relationships, give, you know, redistribute power to give it to the common people, but it isn't actually giving power. It's just giving the capacity to attack people. Um, so my argument is that once social media became hyper-viralized, it wasn't so bad in the, you know, 2005, 2006, it was just about photos of your dog and your summer vacations, and that was totally harmless. But it's once you get the, the news feed, the retweet button, the like button, the share button, all that stuff, it changes to not be about me sharing with you, but about me broadcasting something to make others like what I've said. And a platform that is optimizing for engagement, it turns out, 
is going to try to elicit anger, or rather it rewards, I should say, it rewards the expression of anger. That's what gets you the most, the most engagement. Mm -hmm. So it, it was not an intentional, it was, nobody was trying to destroy us, uh, but the technology kind of made us destroy ourselves. It's not our fault. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a, it's an accident of technology that um, a few platforms perpetrated on us, some with better intentions than others. Facebook in particular, I think, has a lot to answer for because it's never had a good ethical culture. You know, Google, a few others, I think they've, they've tried here and there. Facebook, I think, has not really tried to be a positive force. Yeah, and you've talked about how once we form into teams, you know, all kinds of habits that aren't necessarily good start to show. So mm -hmm. it's social media meets political polarization and to tell us yeah. what happened when that collision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are groupish. So, you know, there's a big debate in the social sciences in the 20th century, whether human beings are basically selfish or altruistic. And I've argued that's the wrong, that's the wrong debate. Um, our genes make us selfish in a sense. Um, our genes make us do what is good for our, our, our the, what is good for the gene survival. Um, and part of that, I've argued, is is to make us groupish. That we're actually trying to do what's good for our group survival. So we're groupish creatures. Now that can be turned up or turned down. And you can. If you, if you see a college football game, I'm going to go back to the University of Virginia this, uh, this weekend where I taught for many years. My son is applying to college and he wants to go to UVA, a place with a, you know, with a football team and school spirit. Um, and you know, a football game, a college football game is this great exercise in tribalism, but it's good natured. It doesn't turn into vi actual violence. Um, but, uh, but under some conditions it can. And so like British soccer hooliganism, I don't know if that's still a thing, but you know, decades ago, like young men would go to soccer games in Britain looking to bash the heads in of supporters of the other team. Um, so we're tribal and it's, it's it, all kinds of things can determine whether that gets turned up into like actual intergroup violence as you get with gangs, gang warfare, um, or turned down and just like playful, like, you know, like in, in team sports usually. Mm -hmm. um, politics of course is a team sport, um, and at, for much of history, it was very bloody and the winners would often kill the losers. And one of the distinctive qualifications of a liberal democracy is people have trust in the institutions and in each other so that if they lose the election, they say, hey, we better try harder next time. Hey, we'd better do an autopsy as the Republican party did in 2012, back when the Republican party was not completely insane. They did an autopsy, like why did we just lose twice in a row to this, this Obama guy? And, you know, why are we losing Hispanics? Like we should, you know, Mexicans, immigrants, they should be voting for us. So, so they had a group that was actually trying to reform. Now, 2012 is sort of the last year of the old era. Uh, my argument is the Tower of Babel fell around 2014. Like that's around then is when everything went completely insane and nothing will ever be the same. So now we have a Republican party that, um, that is not trying to win uh, Mexicans. And we have a democratic party that is so terrible that it's actually that Mexico, that Latinos, I should say, many, from many of the Latin American, not all, but from many Latin American countries are actually moving towards the Republicans. Mm -hmm. So that tells you how terrible both parties are um, these days. Yeah, and you've talked about structural changes. I mean, it's clear that you're you're wrapped up in some pessimist, pessimism. You're not alone. Uh, I think yeah. most people right now uh, are in this place of even dis no, I shouldn't say most, a lot of people are, are hitting points of despair of hopelessness. Yeah. So it, it feels like big changes need to happen for anything to get better. What are your favorite structural yeah. interventions? Yeah. So, so if you keep your eye on, um, what, what puts us into a state of group versus group warfare and what calms us down? So what puts us into that group? group okay. So one, is a feeling of threat uh, and evidence that the other side is so evil that um, the ends justify the means, that anything we do to stop them. And so that, that, that very powerful metaphor from, I think it was Michael Anton in 2016, that this is the flight 93 election, that the other side has gotten control of the airplane, they're gonna crash it into the Capitol. And so anything we do, you know, by any means necessary, we've got to stop them. Mm. Um, and so, so um, the most effective way to keep people in a state of threat and outrage is social media. 
um, Twitter especially, mm-hmm. uh, also Facebook, um, you know, Instagram less so, uh, TikTok less so, but that's going to be scaling up. TikTok is taking over everything. So uh, one of the reasons why I'm so pessimistic, at least for the next five or 10 years, I mean, look, in the long run, things tend to get better. We'll probably get out of this, but it's not gonna happen in the next five or 10 years. I think it's, mm-hmm. it could be many decades. Um, and so the reason I'm so pessimistic is because social media is so incredibly effective at activating our, our deepest group versus group sentiments. So that's one. We need major social media reform um, uh, to decrease the virality. People, you know, and we can talk about that's a whole separate topic is what mm-hmm. to do. But it's not about content moderation. It's not censorship. It's changing mm-hmm. the dynamics so that it's not so explosively viral. <laughs> so social media reform. Um, another thing, let's look at how we run elections. Um, you can you know, uh, uh, politics in our country or elections in our country are funny because we have two parties, which is the second worst number. You know, one is the worst number of parties that you could possibly have, but two is the second worst. Parliamentary systems are generally more stable. Well, they've got their own problems as you see in Italy and other places, but they're not as prone to binary polarization. Two is the worst number for po- binary polarization. But okay, you know, we, we, we survived a long time with that. And at times there've been brief third parties, there've been some realignments. <clears throat> um, but um, as I imagine anybody who, who listens to you or you know, many people involved in the dem- democracy reform space will understand that it's our closed partisan primaries are, I believe, the worst single aspect of our electoral system <clears throat> because electoral politics is zero sum around election day. There's no way to sugarcoat that. You know, There's a zero, a zero sum, one party gets control or they win to see. So, but what you want is you want a few months of that and then they return to governing. And when they're governing, then you can have compromise. That's what the founding fathers insisted on. That's why our system was designed the way it is to force compromise. Um, so anything that makes our legislators think about solving problems with whoever it, whoever the coalition is, they think flexibly and anything that makes them responsive to all of their constituents, that's good. But a closed party primary uh, means that almost all of our legislators, at least in the House of Representatives, I think it's over 90, 95%, I believe. There are very, very few competitive seats, which means that, well, there are some states with open primaries, which is progress. But in most states, a legislator doesn't care what her constituents think. They don't matter. They don't vote for her. Um, the general election doesn't matter. All that matters is the closed party primary. So if I could change two things, it would be ending closed party primaries, um, but by far the larger thing um, is social media reform mm. um, to inc- increase verification, reduce virality, uh, uh, um, uh, dis- change the social incentives so that right now, the more of a jerk you are, the mm-hmm. further you go, the more aggressive you are, the more you attack the other side, you know, you're directly reinforced for that. And if Elon Musk were to seriously rethink the incentives on Twitter, and reverse those, well, then I'd have a lot more hope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, so let's switch from the structural to the individual. There's, there's something to be said for, we do have some power and beyond the ballot box, uh, Mm -hmm. there are things we can do. I, uh, I found myself channeling my, my mom and dad, when you said, you know, the Republican Mm -hmm. party is completely insane because they would take issue with that. Right. And, or even the idea that as, um, Mexican immigrants, they should be Democrats and the democratic party lost them. The democratic party never had them, uh, since they were, you know, Mm. uh, citizens in 2000. So uh, it's, it's, um, oh, there's so much to go in here, so much we're missing yeah. about each other, so much we don't understand. And so many people who are just saying, the last thing I want to do is have conversations with actual people mm-hmm. because all I'm hearing is making me think that that will harm me, that will harm others, and that I can't take it and that it would be just the worst thing morally to do. So mm-hmm. so let's go there. Um, what to you are your you know what to you are the most impactful strategies that an individual Mm -hmm. can can take in this world with social media as it currently is and politics as it currently is to to try to crack open those things so yeah that's a good question um so what i'm I'm playing with some ideas now i haven't written this up or really articulated but i've begun you know i'm so I'll, i'll start where it's easier which is for teenagers and um Teenagers didn't used to get involved in politics until they were, you know, like juniors or seniors in high school. And 
Um, and we always thought it was good that they're involved and, oh, it's good that they're activists. But what do we think about 11 and 12 year olds who are so focused on climate change and politics and abortion rights um, that they don't actually have normal childhoods where they play and have normal relationships with each other? Um, uh, teens in America and Britain and Canada are so horrifically depressed now that more than 100% increase on most measures of depression, anxiety, especially the girls. And what I'm coming to see is that activism is a really, really bad thing for children. Children should not be activists. They don't know anything. Um, they don't tend to push for good policies. They just get sucked into causes. Um, and far better it would be for them to actually grow up to be good people. Focus on that first. And then, you know, maybe when you're much older, you can do some real research and, and you can figure out where you should apply your efforts. But don't just get sucked in at the age of 11 or 12 into protesting. Mm. It's bad for you. It's bad for the world. You're not helping anyone. Mm. So, right? so are, you, are you giving a parenting strategy here? Well, it, so yes, but not that parents can tell their children don't be activists. I'm actually more saying to like everybody, like especially you know, I'm a professor. And like, we all have this shared attitude that it's so great that Gen Z is so, it's so great they're so involved in politics. And I wanna question that. I think it's terrible that they're involved in politics. Um, as I said, it's not at all clear they're doing any good um, on climate change is the best place where you might say, yes, it's very serious, but a lot of the things pushed for are counteract, counterproductive. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, well, anyway, I don't wanna get into details, but the point is mindless activism done in a context of what I, what I've called structural stupidity is a bad thing. Structural mm -hmm. stupidity is the state that occurs when if uh, if someone dissents or they raise, they bring in evidence saying, wait, maybe we're wrong. Maybe we should look at it another way. Um, they'll be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And if they will be destroyed, then there will be no dissent. And if there's no dissent, then you're almost always wrong. Almost yeah. everything your group is trying to do is wrong and it's gonna make things worse and you should stop. So once you realize that activism now is mostly, is almost entirely done in structurally stupid groups, you see that mm. activism is a bad thing. Mm. But I'm not just, I'm, tr I'm trying to get round, a roundup way to answer your question. <clears throat> that is, if we look at children, I think it's clear they should stop it. They should just stop it and, and they should have fun and they should not worry about politics. Mm. <clears throat> um, and actually, I, I want to... Um... I want to share something with you that that is very resonant with this point. I was speaking at a high school not long ago, and it, I was speaking with the parents. And one mother said, I can't believe this, but I think that the the student I was raising to be open-minded, mm -hmm. I think I accidentally raised to be just the opposite. Oh, did she encourage and, activism? Yes. Yeah. And it was a, a girl, I'm sure. Yes. Wow. Yeah, Why do you right. say that? Why do you say it was uh, a girl? Because it's not a problem for the boys. It's a huge problem for the girls what? on the left. No yeah. Way. So, um, uh, well, let's see. Maybe I could share with you some slides. Oh, no, I won't do slides. I'll just tell you. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm collecting all the data on, mental, on teen mental health, and I'm trying to understand what happened to Gen Z. And uh, many people know that it's worse for the girls, that the girls' rates of depression and anxiety are up. Of all the data sets that have looked at teenagers, only two that I found asked them about their politics, because you don't usually ask high school kids about their politics. Um, and um, one, let's see, what, one was the, um, oh, the Monitoring the Future study, and the other was a Pew study done at the beginning of COVID. And both of them found a three-way interaction where, um, where their depression rise is by far the highest for girls, but not all for females, but not all females, young girls, uh, but not all young girls, young girls on the left. Wow. In fact, the Pew study so, uh, the Pew study in, done in um, March of, two, of 2020 found the question was, has a doctor or mental health professional ever told you that you have a mental health disorder? And uh, for almost for all the other, for young boys and, and for conservatives, uh, and, no, I'm sorry, this is, um, this is college age. Uh, yeah, this was college age. This is uh, young adults. Um, what they found was that for most of the groups, it's like between 15 and 28% say yes, which is very high. Wow. For, for girls on the left, it's 55%. The majority say that they have a mental health disorder, the majority. Wow. Now, some of that is that young girls on the left, because of their activism, they valorize mental illness. Um, they, don't, they, they want to be victims. They want to be oppressed. They want to have something wrong with them. Wow. So 
there's a real toxic nature to to sort of left-wing female activism. It's incredibly destructive to the girls themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another reason, that's actually the, sort of the motivating reason that I got into this, like they should just stop it and we should stop mm -hmm. encouraging them. It's really bad for them and it's actually really bad for the world. Wow, um, so, that's, so that's strategy one is just like parents, kids, get get off activism at a certain age work on relationships until, figure yeah, out until what before, human communication is a little that's more. right develop your abilities develop yourself um uh yeah do all that first before change you know improve yourself before you try to change the world you don't know how to change the world it's very hard to change the world so don't do it um but the reason i started with this is this this actually applies to adults as well and what i mean by that is um is we are complicated creatures that have many roles. And I I am a father and I'm a professor and I'm a brother and I'm many, many things. Um, and while I don't call myself a Democrat anymore, I'm, I'm nothing and we can get into, into some of that later, but I used to say I'm a Democrat and I'm other things, but, but there are many identities. And one thing that social media has done is it has greatly raised up the political identity and sort of squashed out everything else. Um, there's a quote, one of the, I'm, I'm active in positive psychology and there's a quote, uh, Chris Peterson, one of the founders wants to find positive psychology as, as um, the, or the central idea of positive psychology is other people matter. Hmm. Um, that's really the big finding is it's just so much of it is our relationships. That's what most matters in life. That's the road to happiness. Always look at people's relationships. And what social media and especially political social media has done to us is it's changed that. It, it's made us say other people matter more than the people near us. Strangers mm -hmm. who I'll never meet matter more than the person sitting next to me who I'm not paying attention to. Um, other people who said something somewhere in Indiana that I'll never meet, mm -hmm. but everyone's mad about it now. Uh, and millions of people will be mad about it now. Uh, it's just this incredible hyperinflation of our political selves and our worst possible political selves, which pushes out all of our other selves. So I think that almost all of us are spending way too much time on politics and in a, in a completely non-productive way, I would say a destructive way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you want to really learn about something, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm active about open primaries, but I'm not confident that we're right. And 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 I try to read about it, and um, uh, and you know most reforms I, I don't know about most I think most reforms backfire most reforms don't actually either they don't work or else they actually backfire, so uh, I'm not saying don't think about it but recognize that your participation is most likely zero that it, it's not making things better and it's quite possibly making things worse so if we all yeah. spent a lot less time thinking about it then we'd only be twice as mad as we were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, so if we're moving from like the structural, like we got to have some structural changes, but I'm not optimistic about those. Those might never come. Um, and so the question is, how do we live? How do we live together? How do we live our lives in a world of so much confusion and, and anger? Yeah. And so this, I think, and, and this is, you know, this is where I think you and I really will connect even more is, um, you know, is how do you, how do you how do you live around people who are so moralistic? And for that, for that, I was And, so and by the way, influenced. can you can you define what you mean by moralistic? Yeah. So um uh so moralistic and judgmental, all these terms, they refer to one of the great truths. Actually, let me see if I have a couple of quotations at hand. Mm -hmm. So I wrote so my first book was called The Happiness Hypothesis. And what I did was I read um, ancient writings. I read all the ancient writings I could find um, that had any sort of advice for life. You know, a lot of them are just like lists of who begat whom and things like that. But those that are wisdom tradition. So here's the book. Yep. And I read, you know, East and West, and I organized them into um, into 10 sort of 10 basic claims. And then you evaluate whether they're true. So number four is the faults of others, page 59. And you find exactly the same idea in Buddhism, Hinduism, Stoicism. And this is, this is um, right. This is the way to live. Um, so why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you do not notice the log in your own eye? 
you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's. Mm -hmm. So how about before you go yelling and screaming and criticizing and protesting, how about if you, if you uh, look about the things that you do and work on yourself? I can tell you, if we all keep going the way we're going, so angry about what others are doing, we're going to hell. We're not going to fix any of our problems. But if we were to stop that and say, how about I'm going to work on myself first, and then only then will I criticize others. Well, then actually we could make it. Yeah. Here's the same, here's the same idea from Buddha. It's easy to see the faults of others, but difficult to see one's own faults. One shows the faults of others like chaff winnowed in the wind, but one conceals one's own faults uh, as a cunning gambler conceals his dice. Yeah. And you get this over and over again. Um, the ancients in all societies don't, well, there are a few that say get more angry. There are a few that say, you know, attack them and damn them. And there are a few, mm -hmm. but the, the real wisdom traditions say, uh, say, stop that. Yeah. Say, um, uh, they say we are all blinded. Oh, here's my favorite. I've got to read the whole one because this okay, is go for it. this is this is the the greatest piece of wisdom about morality ever written. This is from Sen San, a Chinese Zen master in the eighth century, uh, and he says, um, uh, "The perfect way is only difficult for those who pick and choose. Do not like, do not dislike. All will then be clear. Make a hairbreadth difference, and heaven and earth are set apart." If you want the truth to stand clear before you, never be for or against. The struggle between for and against is the mind's worst disease. Hmm. So once you accept a good evil framing, hmm. you can't think straight. Uh, you become stupid. You become really like you lose 10 or 20 IQ points. So this is why I'm saying we all need to tone it down, back off, spend a lot less time on social media, give each other the benefit of the doubt, develop the rest of our personalities and stop just being impotent political hate machines oh my gosh so many places to go to from here the first okay go for it when i when i think of those wise ancient voices i think of lots of calm mm -hmm. i think of yeah. relative calm of sort of you know we're hunky-dory so we're gonna we're gonna do this thing that's good for our minds and our souls and our hearts and then i look at today and the sense of threat and anxiety and mm -hmm. transition and turbulence is so high that i know a lot of people for whom the idea of not being for or against is basically like saying, I have no stake in this world. I don't care where it goes, that it's a kind of apathy and it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. how, how, does, how does wisdom like that fit in a time like this? Because in a funny way, our time is now once again like that of the ancients. So in ancient days, it didn't make sense to think you could control the world because you couldn't, you had no idea of the weather and the, there could be all kinds of weather catastrophes tomorrow. Now we have weather forecasting. Um, there could be a plague. You had no idea. And, and you and your children could die tomorrow. There could be a war. I mean, the war, ancient world was very uncontrollable. And I would argue that in the 20th century, the world became so controllable that we could actually dispense with that advice. And we actually thought, no, you know, I, I, I can control my world, not just my world, mm. the democratic political world. Mm. In large societies, no one ever had the sense that they could change the laws. Mm. And it was never quite true that we could change the laws as individuals, but you know, occasionally one person does have an influence. So we had this idea that not just that the world actually is controllable, but actually that you have an obligation to try to control it. If well, you're a good even, person- it, Yeah, it extends to social media where there's an obligation to have an opinion about everything. That that's, that's a right. way, all that's the way right. to that. And all of that, that's right. And all of that is a dead end. All of that is a dead end. So if you actually want to try to you know, change voting laws or something, great, more power to you. But if you're doing it by posting on social media, you're wasting everyone's time, especially your own. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't really do anything. And to the extent that it's ever effective, it's only effective by intimidation. It effect, and that's, you know, it, 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 social media is really, really good for intimidating leaders, for making them bow to the whim of protesters. So it messes up institutions um, and it, it ends up backfiring. So just a little aside, mm -hmm. but what I'm coming to see more and more is, Okay, actually, this is just, um, you know, the Republican Party, I believe, is is the much worse party, you know, the election denying, the lack of any real programs, the, the some of the people they nominate, but the, but the Democrats can't beat them, um, because the Democrats, it's not that the party is so messed up, it's that the cultural left has this serious, serious problem that it doesn't make arguments anymore. What it does is Everyone is outgunning for the dissident. 
they don't shoot their little darts into the conservatives. They shoot them into anyone on the left who dares question. And so um, all of this left-wing activism, it's almost all conducted on Twitter and a few other platforms. It's not real activism. It's just cruelty. It's just showing off. Um, so yeah, I'd say just stop all of that. It's not doing anything. It's, it's, in fact, it's actually hurting the Democrats. I think we're going to see, you know, we're recording this just before election day and, you know, we're likely to see Republican victories. Um, so, you know, these are pure, I mean, the, the victories on social media are pyrrhic victories. They're victories that you can win a battle, but you then end up losing the war. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of ranting now. I'm, I'm, I'm no, sad. I mean, no, 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 that, that is okay. So, so I'm thinking, you know, again about let, let's, let's paint this picture. Let's say that today there is a person who is out there and is absolutely spending a lot of time on social media and mm -hmm. believes that that is the way that they are good people. They're showing mm -hmm. everyone how good they are by standing up for the things they believe in and they're doing it every day and it's preoccupying mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe their family doesn't really love it, but Hey, mm -hmm. but this matters. Right. And let's say that a year from now, that person has actually done a 180 spends less time on social mm -hmm. media, spends less time thinking about politics and feels like they're doing even more good for the world. What did that person have to do? Mm -hmm. What steps did that person yeah. have to take on their own? And what might have what what is feasible as the first step for someone yeah. in that mindset? So the first step is to break the spell. Um we um there's a so we we're always sort of sizing up public opinion we sort of can get immersed in something you know um and and there is a kind of a well it's, actually, it's, it's called the matrix i mean the the um uh, william gibson who wrote the book the Neuro neuromancer coined the term um the matrix the matrix and he said it's a consensual hallucination mm -hmm. and for anyone who's seen any of those movies the matrix movies you literally you plug something in it goes into your brain and then you enter this this co-imagined world um, but the world of the matrix was actually co-imagined and it was like coherent. You could navigate through it. The world of social media is not shared. It's like, you see your little part of it, but others see it differently. There is no coherence. There is no shared, there is no really shared world. Um, and as long as you're in that, you're insane. I mean, you're insane in the sense that you cannot understand reality. Um, and so you have to unplug, you have to get out of it. Um, that's the first thing that has to happen. Uh, the second thing I think is that there tends to be some sort of epiphany. Um, you know, I can tell, like mine was, you know, it was reading all these conservative writings, hmm. at, which I only did because I wanted to write a book to help the Democrats. But for me, oh, and then as I talk about The Righteous Mind, a, the, like the what set me up for that epiphany was my time in India. It was spending three months in India where I tried to understand a society that was religious, very gender segregated, hierarchical, in every sense, compatible with the like the religious right Christian view of this was 1993. So it was like the moral majority. Like, so I tried to understand that and see that see it from what they were trying to do, not from my outside lens that they're sexist and, and mm -hmm. oppressive and all these things. So so India and um uh, and reading conservative writings and as I've begun to say recently actually psychedelic drugs. I literally mm -hmm taking LSD you and mushrooms, you know, you literally step outside of everything you know and you look down. So I had a bunch of things that prepared me to step out of the matrix, uh, but it took a number of years. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you, how about you? Were you ever a partisan? Because now you're doing all this, you know, this, you know, cross-partisan work. Do yeah. you have a story about how that happened to you? It was, it was talking to my parents. It was getting mm. outraged and then bringing it up to them because they were the closest conservatives to me. And every time them saying something I hadn't considered that calmed mm. me down, it didn't mean I changed my mind politically, but it calmed me down. And then I would go back to my friends on the left and, and be like, well, y'all, did you think of it this way? Or even if I couldn't come up with anything mm. to say, I would take what they were saying with many more grains of salt and, mm. and not exactly subscribe to the whole kit, right? Okay. And so, what yeah. year was this? How old were you when this was happening, when you were going back and forth between your parents and your friends? Oh, man. I, uh, it was probably right, the 2015, 2016 presidential campaign. That was it. That was it. Because that's okay. when I saw a lot of people in my blue community get really, really scared, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I, it felt like I, I had almost access to a little bit of immunity from being too scared. Hmm. That, okay. That's sort of how it felt. 
Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I'm still coming back to this idea of all these issues that are out there in politics are so important and, and people feel already so certain, right? And we know that certainty makes curiosity a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, you started yeah. reading conservative writings because you were curious. You were like, well, yeah. let me let me yeah. go check it out. And then, so you had that invitation. I think a mm-hmm. lot of people right now have gotten to the point where even if they were to turn off social media, let's say, they're still, they don't they don't have any motive to actually engage with someone who disagrees with them. Mm-hmm. It, that in and of itself is a reason, right? But me being a good person is a reason yeah. not to engage across the divide. So let, let's take that idea okay. that to be a good person, I can't engage across the divide. When is that idea right? given that morality should inform our actions. And when Mm -hmm. is that idea wrong? Well, I'd say it's always wrong. I mean, like, what game are you playing? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are multiple games you can be playing at any time. So, um, um, you know, so let's take, let's take Daryl Davis, who I'm sure is known to many in the community here. You know, so here we have, we have a black musician, a blues, you know, blues musician. Uh, who was sitting, you know, as he tells the story, if I remember correctly, he was, you know, after he was playing, he he was sitting in a redneck bar or something where he, some, I'm sorry, he was sitting with somebody who was playing and the guy next to him, he struck up a conversation with him. It turns out the guy's in the clan. Now, what game should he play? He could have played the outrage game and said, you know, you're a racist, get away from him. I'm not talking to you. Um, and I don't know whether his original motive was curiosity because there's the mm-hmm. curiosity game, which is a selfish game, which is, you know what? I want to learn. I, I'm curious. I I want to grow from this, or whether he was playing some strategic game. Like hmm, I want to I want to get this guy away from the evil side. So there are a lot of games that you can play. Now, had this occurred uh, on Twitter with lots of people watching and policing each other, then he it would be very hard to reach out, and you'd have to you know bash him and call him a white supremacist, which actually be one of the only correct usage of the term white supremacist in, in this day and age. <laughs> right, but. Um, but you can play multiple different games. And so um, so what if your game, so what if your game is, I wanna help my side win? Let's start with that. Okay, you're a committed partisan, you wanna help your side win. Well, if you really wanna help your side win, are you better off insulting the person and attacking them? Now in a real war, if you could kill them, yeah, maybe, maybe that would be helpful. But in a culture war, you can't win by attacking the other side. The harder you attack them, the stronger they get. That's the fundamental mistake. That's part of why I'm urging people to just step back, stop fighting the fake war, because social media is not a real war. Um, the more you attack them, the stronger they get. Um, and we see this. What happens is each side is so stuffed full of examples of the other side being hateful, and they've got videos to prove it. Right. Um, and there are a lot of people on the other side. And so if you know, if if one out of a thousand says something horrible, um, you know, every every month, right. you've got infinite amounts of evidence that they're horrible. So um, so if the goal is just to help your side win, you should engage with them. You might learn more about them. You'd be more effective in, in convincing them or in, in helping your side work strategically. So, so if the goal is just to win, you should engage with them. If your goal is curiosity that you want to learn and make yourself stronger, you should engage with them. Um, if your goal is to maybe convert them, which also would be helping your side win, you should engage with them. Um, I can't see any reason to not engage other than um, if your prestige would suffer because others would slam you mm-hmm. for not following purity laws. And this is what's happening on both sides, but especially on the left, the left is so crippled by its, its uh, uh, purity laws. Something I've observed, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I wrote the, uh, this Coddling the American Mind article with Greg Lukianoff in 2015. No one has yet said why we're wrong. Um, mm-hmm. They say why we're bad, but they won't even read it and they will not read the book, the book version 2018. So the purity laws that are especially operative on the left are so crippling that people on the left, that in the, the activist left, I should say, not most of it, but the activist left, the ones that are doing all the, you know, the attacking, the canceling, the shaming, um, they're structurally stupid. Like they really don't know what's going on, but they're, but everyone's afraid of them. Mm-hmm. And this, I think, is what's really turning people off of the Democrats. Right. That's one so, of the things that's really So you're speaking off. after years of having built, you know, your research and and your everything you do around some of these ideas. Was there a moment, do you remember yourself being afraid to speak your mind into spaces oh, yeah. where, do you remember the moment where that changed? 
Well, I, I still am in many cases, but there's a there's a general change of identity. So I felt I began writing memos to help the Democrats use moral psychology in 2007. And it was okay because I was basically saying, you know, look guys, you know, I'm one of I'm one of you and here's here's criticism that will help. You know, if we if we want to beat the Republicans, we've got to stop saying this. We start saying this. so. So it was easy to be critical when it was like, you know, I, I'm on the team and we're doing this. Um, and and as long as George W. Bush was president, I I kind of felt like I had to be against them. I really I thought he was a terrible president, and and it, I really felt us versus them. And once Obama was elected, I felt like it was two things. One, I felt like okay, now like, you know, the good side has the White House. Now I can think like more openly or, and, and um, it's not such an existential struggle for control. Um, and, uh, and also that's when I was really writing The Righteous Mind. And that's when I began to actually talk with conservatives. Uh, I was invited to give a talk at AEI, uh, which at first I was a little nervous about, like there's all these conservatives there, are they gonna be mean to me? And it turns out conservatives are actually really polite. They're much more polite than liberals because they have a culture of like politeness, like you shouldn't shame people, you know, you should be nice to them. Um, and again, if people are listening, obviously there's, you know, horrible people in the far right. And so so the far right is, is not conservative, very important point. The far right is not conservative. It's sort of radical, you know, quasi authoritarian populist. And the far left is not liberal. It's mm -hmm. sort of, you know, radical, quasi-authoritarian, uh, well, actually uh, uh, extreme egalitarian is really the term. Um, so for me, there was some change. There was a period when I was writing the book when after sort of laying out the morality of both sides, I said to my wife, I'm not sure I can call myself a liberal anymore. And by mm -hmm. liberal, I meant at the time leftist or, or you know, I now, I now very much call myself a liberal because I'm opposed to illiberalism on both sides. So it was a gradual evolution um, and then, and I began speaking up and saying things and I was always sort of like on the edge of what was acceptable to say. And then after 2015, when all hell broke loose on campus and with the, the, at Yale, at Yale Halloween protests that then went national, right. um, since then, there's been a real split where the academic world, which I, I used to love, I, I used to love being a professor and I felt like, mm -hmm. you know, we could explore anything, we could talk about anything and that's not true anymore. Um, so I still self-censor a lot because it's, it's just, um, it's just, it's just not where, I mean, if a student reports you and, uh, you know, on the, on the back of, here, I'll even show you on the back of my ID yes. card, students are encouraged to report us, um, here Whoa. on the back of the, on the back of the card. Yeah. So it has, it has important numbers, emergency number 911, public safety gives the number, campus transportation, um, uh, bias response line, uh, um, 212-998-2277. Hmm. So students are, and it's in all the bathrooms. So it's like state of emergency, the professor says something that you think is biased, report them. Um, and so, and I have been reported. So mm -hmm. um, so it's just, you just really, it's just not worth taking risks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I've, I've watched one of the you know, most respected institutions of the country, which is the universities, the elite universities really lose, lose respect, lose trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a self-inflicted wound, in my opinion. Yeah, I have to ask you something that a lot of people ask me. They, they say, where's the red line? There's got to be some person or some topic that I should not talk, that I cannot talk to. There's got to be a red line. I've struggled so much with answering this question because I don't have a red line and I'm afraid yeah. to say it because mm -hmm. it feels yeah. like by definition, I must be a bad person if if I don't see the devil anywhere immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, does that make yeah. sense? No, yeah. it does. It does. So so what people when people say that, that shows that they have they've already framed so you know, language just conveys a tiny little bit, and there's a huge mental structure in the speaker's head, and there's a huge mental structure in the listener's head. And the speaker usually assumes that the listener shares a lot of the structure. Right. So for someone to say that, they have a structure in which it's like pre you know, it's it's pre-assumed, it's 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 structured in that you wouldn't talk with the devil. And now it's just a question of are Republicans the devil or is it only right wing republic or whatever it is? Like, where's yeah. the line? Or if you're on the um, right, you know, you might say the same about the socialist, you know, yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and that's and that's the concept of moral creep, right? Where I was at this conference recently where where you know the speaker was saying, you know, I, yeah, you can have like a couple of non-negotiables, just make sure that there's only two or three. But in my head I went, well, yeah, the why? thing is if if yeah, one why? of your non-negotiables is like racism and another is fascism or like it's socialism or whatever and you see racism in a lot of places or so yeah. then then it's a thousand it's not really two that's right and you can't say that racism is a non-negotiable because it, it's not it's not like a thing that is easily recognized that's what a lot of the culture war is over is you know what counts as racism or right. fascism these are very loose terms that have undergone extraordinary concept creep um you know, I mean, like the the phrase that was very fashionable a while ago, you know, punch more Nazis, um, yeah. you know, when there were actual back when, what was his name? The guy who ended up leading the Charlottesville thing. Um, it was, uh, what was his name? Spencer, yeah. Spencer. Yeah. So okay. like in 2015, I think it was like somebody punched him in the face and it was on camera. And, you know, there's a lot of clear like, yeah, you know, punch that. If you can't punch Nazis, who can you punch? The problem is that the word Nazi is used so promiscuously right. that almost anyone that the left doesn't like is a Nazi. Um, so that means you can punch anyone. So, so that whole framing of you must have a red line, what's your red line, mm -hmm. that, that just assumes all this stuff. Whereas, you know, I dare, I dare them to say that to Daryl Davis. Daryl, you must have a red line, right. um, someone you won't talk to. I mean, if he talks to members of the KKK mm -hmm. and gets their robes away, I don't see what the problem is with that. So you don't, do you have a red line? No, I don't even no, know what it means. No red line, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I have, yeah. I have values. I have principles. I, I like to think I have integrity. Mm -hmm. So I, I do have one, but it's very different. I'm a professor, and as a professor, I'm, I think, and I, and my formal title is professor of ethical leadership at NYU Stern because in you know, a business school, everything has to have leadership tacked onto it. So, um. So I do think a lot. I, I, I used to teach a course on professional responsibility, and I taught about fiduciary duty. Now, the concept of fiduciary duty, it means a relationship of trust in which if I'm a fiduciary for you, you know, let's say you're an orphan and your parents left the money and trust for you, and I'm the person responsible, I have a fiduciary duty to you, I must put your interest first. I cannot have any compromise. I can never use that money for my benefit. It's a very high ethical bar. And and I'm, I'm, I think this is a really powerful and important concept that, that we, that especially in any profession, we have professional duties that rise to that level of fiduciary duties. As a social scientist, as a professor, I think I have a fiduciary duty to the truth. That is, I must never, never lie. Um, if I, when I write, like, you know, everything I say in my books, mm -hmm. you know, there's a normal way we speak in which you say things that aren't exactly true. But as a professor, I feel like, no, I can't say things that aren't true. And so that's my red line is that I can't cool. lie. So let me and ask it's horrible. about when that. I see just just finish up when I see like what what I see happening among a lot of professors now is because they are now so politicized, they actually do lie. Um, they actually mm -hmm. will twist the truth. And that I think is that crosses my red line. Mm -hmm. Not that I won't talk to them, but I think they are wrong. And I'm willing to say they are wrong. So the fiduciary, uh, you know, loyalty to the truth. Uh, resonates mm -hmm. with me as a journalist. It's one of yes. the things you try yes. to do. But what what does your fiduciary duty to the truth mandate that you do when you're in conversation with someone who seems to believe something totally untrue? For a lot of people, that's the abort button. That's the, mm -hmm. there's nowhere to go from here and I don't even want to get but, into but that But that's every position, conversation. Right? Oh, what are you talking about? Everyone right, believes okay. things that are not true. So if you won't yeah. talk to people who believe untrue things, then there's mm -hmm. nobody to talk to, including well, yourself. Well, then I guess, I guess the distinction for people then is, and this is fun because I'm, di I'm dissecting what I'm hearing. The distinction from people is not only that it's untrue, but that it's uh, untrue and harmful. And if it's untrue and harmful, then I can't abide even being in its presence. Or if I'm in its mm -hmm. presence, my, maybe, maybe they think my fiduciary duty to the truth means I need to correct this person or mm -hmm. present some deterrent right. to them, like breaking yeah. our relationship. Yeah. So there's all these there's all these terrible, terrible ideas that are common among activists, and it's part of what binds them together. Let's remember that religions are held together by untrue things. And the more untrue it is, the better it works as a way to bind people together. That's what faith is. So this is what some some of the scholarship on religion and faith um, from a sort of evolutionary perspective, David Sloan Wilson, his book, Darwin's Cathedral. Um, so there are articles of faith that are used to bind people together. I'm, I'm a Durkheimian. This is what Emil Durkheim would say. 
And um, if you simply want to say some people believe untrue things that are harmful, well, you know, a lot of people believe that nuclear power should be banned. That's an incredibly harmful belief. Mm -hmm. um, that belief has probably done more to destroy the environment than anything else. Um, if the U.S. had continued um, building nuclear power plants in the 70s and continued making them cheaper and safer, we would have decarbonized to the level that France did. France kept mm -hmm. going. So France has much lower carbon emissions than the U.S., but because of the anti-nuclear movement, it's been a complete economic, uh, ecological catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone I'm talking to says, you know, I'm against nuclear power, am I going to say, ah, that is so harmful? Or if they say, you know, oh, you know, nuclear power is, is the worst form of energy, that is wrong and harmful. Am I going to cut them off? Of course mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Everyone believes wrong, harmful things, or every, everyone believes wrong things, and then the harm is usually not in the person; it's in the it's in the viewer who declares it to be harmful. Mm, I see that. So uh, I'm I'm noticing we're kind of ragging on activism a lot, and well, uh, I, yes, I wonder, I, okay, yeah, yeah, I Go wonder ahead. if you could say, you know, given that we always try to look at the other side of something, right? What do yeah, you credit yeah. activists for in this era? What are we learning yeah. from the methods and the tactics? Well, so serious activists, like, so, you know, the, the, the freedom riders, the, 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 the uh, civil rights movement, um, I was very fortunate to be invited, um, but John Lewis, the last time he led a, the civil rights pilgrimage for Congress, congressmen um, in 2019, uh, I was invited along on, on that trip because I study, you know, crossing divides, and it was an incredibly powerful trip, and one thing you learned was just how well thought out this all was and the strategy that they used over many, many years. Um, and, um, um, uh, oh, actually, let's see. Um, um, so you learn how, how much thought they put in to a strategy that would actually work and how much they trained and how much they toughened up their people so that when people yelled and screamed the N word at them, they could withstand it and they could withstand it with dignity. And it was that dignity that would win people mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. And they kept their eyes on the prize. So I credit activists for civil rights, for the women's movement, for gay rights. Um, uh, so activism, uh, you know, uh, I, I, when I was in South Africa with my family a couple of years ago, we went to the apartheid museum and you see you know, how Nelson Mandela did it. And, you know, mm -hmm. Mandela and others, what did they do? They, they took a page from, uh, from Gandhi and King. Um, so activism in history has been tremendously important, but that was structurally brilliant activism. They sought out dissent, they hashed things out. Um, and I, as I argue, everything changed around 2014, 2015. So I'll just put out a thought there and then I actually I will have to go, mm -hmm. but I just put out, thought, which is um, the gay marriage movement, I believe is going to be the last successful activist movement because it's the last movement mm. that made arguments and tried to win people over. Mm. And that began with Andrew Sullivan in the 90s, making the argument for gay marriage when it seemed like an insane thing to argue for. And Jonathan Rauch out mm. arguing why people should. So, so, so activists for gay rights used to make arguments and they would win people over. And that was good activism. But everyone has the misfortune to be doing activism after 2014 is in the post babel world mm -hmm. where it's done almost, it's mostly on social media. Um, it is done where you destroy dissenters. You don't make arguments, you attack other people, other views. So I don't have much respect for activists today. Uh, not, I'm not saying, they're not bad people. It might seem that I'm saying that. I'm, I'm saying in the same way that the universities have gotten messed up by structural stupidity and journalism, we see it like the New York Times, oh, yeah. all sorts of, Institute got messed up by structural stupidity and the Republican party is completely messed up and has no dissent and they got rid of all their moderates. So, mm. you know, I'm criti more critical of the left because that's the world I live in. They're the ones who are affecting institutions, but the Republican party is, is the more clear and present danger because they actually are trying to subvert democratic institutions. Mm. Um, but no, I guess I have to say that for activists today on most of the activist causes, um, the, you know, the social justice causes, I don't have respect for what they're doing because, because what they're doing isn't working. Mm -hmm. it, it's often backfiring. It's often undermining um, what they're aiming to it's, do. It's it, undermining. That's right. And it really is helping the Republicans win. 
um, if it wasn't for the social justice activists, I don't think the Republican Party was, would, would sweep to victory tomorrow. Okay, that concludes another episode of the Braver Angels podcast. Thanks again to John Haidt for joining us and uh, sharing all the things going on <laughs> in his brain and, and how he sees the world and, and how it interacts in a lot of ways with the big questions we're asking at Braver Angels and beyond. So to good arguments, to actually having them, and to hopefully being less stupid structurally and in our own lives. So thanks everyone. As always, any feedback on our episodes, ideas for future episodes, send a note to media at braverangels.org. I'm your host, Monica Guzman. Thank you for joining us. I Thank appreciate you, Monica.